point out why do people resist this linguistic induction of social facts or of natural world? You reduce it, you reject it because you then do not have agency outside you or the group of community. You know, it's a very, um, it's a, you lose your notions of autonomy and agency for action and for change. Because if it is a group of people who create that whatever social complexity, then uh, you know you control it, you create it, you remove it. You are the person who is the originator and destructor of it. And that's why people still tend to uh, resist it. And I would, I mean, I am very sympathetic to the larger question of how much language influences our way of we make of the world. But definitely, I would still tend to move away from saying the world is reduced to the linguistic categories. And there are good reasons to think there is an alternate reality outside and that will hold good when you ask for gender as well as I mean whether it's a gender is a cultural category is still very important. I'm just talking about the linguistic category question. Okay. Um, the Chomsky is a very good example thanks for the pragmatics thing and I think what I'm going to take a lesson from this is to actually uh, point out why interdisciplinarity is so essential to social theory. I mean there are social scientists who are not exposed for example to the study of language um, whether it's Chomsky or the pragmatics and therefore, one of the most important ways uh, in by which I think social theory gets enriched is in dialogue and borrowing concepts from different directions. And hopefully, the question of uh, uh, you know the thing. But I think also I must also point out that the way in which we understand multiple particulars, uh, very large systems, have also been understood in a very different way through the study of complex systems. Very interesting work on how to look at uh, big animal clusters individually very very wide distribution of objects and so on and I think there is also very interesting work waiting to be done in that many of it in the sciences have gone on into, through computer simulations and I in the, so the, some of the sociology groups we are talking to they are also separately very interested in using computer methods simulation methods for modeling certain big social processes and so on so I, I you know I personally I have a big problem with that but that's a you know that's a kind of a way um, kind of a tool which I think might become actually far more uh, popular. Um, so, and then, okay, the final one for Professor Rame had a lot of very interesting questions, and I'm just going to very briefly. Um, no, I want to distinguish between what I believe in and what, uh, you know, others have talked about theory, uh, uh, you know, all these other things, right? So, the bird's eye view objective is one of the arguments by a long, you know, for, uh, for centuries of different writers who come back to the question of moving away in order to see it and so on. And, and I, I agree with you very much and very, very deeply that this whole question about the theory is very flawed. That is, that's why the phenomenological account of social theory is not moving away, but immersing more deeply into it. That's why the shift into the phenomenology which we did with Kraken and Jayati also been deeply interested in is not saying that I understand something because I go away from it. But rather saying I understand something when I give in to it more and more into it. So Modi should actually, you know, do the reverse, not talk about the spiritual, but be participant in that act. And perhaps after he does enough of it, he can talk about it. But definitely, he should not say anything right now. But um, uh, you know, you know what is also happening to the social science community in India and this government. Anyway, the the sun and the east is an interesting question, and uh, the sun rises in the east. This is the grand debate about the Copernican revolution on which influences Kant and so on. You know, definitely sun rises in the east, if it is right or wrong, can be judged on certain parameters. And whether it's a religion or not is not the question, right? So if uh, if there was a conflict with the church about the sun, it is where actually not really about sun rising in the east, it's about the geocentric or the heliocentric. Um, but I would say, anyway, this sentence is a very problematical sentence because somebody has to define to me what rises is. It's a very odd definition of rising, you know, that sun is moving like the east and so on. So I, I think I'm very, I agree entirely with what you're saying in that, so I, I can't add anything more to it. Um, the question of prediction, okay, very interesting because this has been the major question of the uh, distinction between science and non science. You know, Popper does this when he wants to call pseudoscience and science. Astrology has always been a big problem for scientists. Why? Because most of them believe in it and use it. But on the other hand, they want to say, you know, astrology is not a science. Astrology does prediction, it does calculation, there's extensive mathematics in astrology. There are conceptual structures, there are justificatory structures. 
But obviously, astrology is not a science. There are very good reasons for it. Uh, you know, I, we can talk about it. You know, including one about the fact that it is fundamentally mistaken about the effect of uh, objects like planets on human systems. I mean, there itself it's flawed. So you can have a, and that's why uh, structurally it may have so so called success, etc. But this, even today, is a very deep question within philosophy of science. What constitutes a non-science or a pseudo-science? What you would call as a pseudo-science? But predict, the reason I was talking about not prediction as theory, I'm saying the match between theory and the world. If you if you say that is a let us say you say uh, Dumont's theory of caste is the best, for example, suppose you say. Then if I ask you why, then you will say its match with the real society is uh, grounded in certain things. And typically we use prediction as a form of grounding. That is, people tend to use prediction as a proof that a theory matches the world. And I think that is also a very deep problem, you know, because my uh, con uh, counter to this argument is that example of a TV show. You know, I know, I think the TV show is the greatest predictor I know. You know, it predicts when the, uh, you know, this match which is happening today, which I hope India won. <laughs> no? No? Okay, I'm really sorry to uh, But if, uh, you know, but that match was predicted four years back. They knew that time you were going to watch it. I mean, what more kind of prediction do you want? You know, it beats any kind of uh, scientific and astrological prediction because in 2011, somebody asked you when is the finals going to be held, you would have said it's on this day at this time. But that notion of prediction is related to the notion of control and etc. So there is a, you know, I think the question, what I was trying to say is we make, you know, the matching is done through prediction. And finally, uh, yes, I agree with you on the transcreation environment, etc. The, okay, the, the answer to this is this. There is no single concept which is available. So philosophers who try and describe it are always saying all concepts come as a web of concepts or a network of concepts. And that, that's also the answer I was telling about the Foucault thing and the power. There's no one concept which comes by itself. It's impossible. There's, the only way in which a concept attains the status of conceptful, in a sense, is to be always in a family of concepts. So, and that is also therefore the question of the ethics of invoking a concept to talk about it. So, in fact, I tell my students, if you suddenly say I am oppressing you in class, if I am giving you an assignment, then you have to be very careful in using that term, because the oppression comes with a lot of other connected concepts, and there are people who are really being oppressed are suffering a lot, and your context is very different, and they are also suffering a lot, I think. But, therefore, when you use it, you should be very careful about the concepts you use to describe your experience. So that is our whole point about ethics of theorizing. You know, what is our moral responsibility when I use the concepts I use to describe others? In other words, what is my moral responsibility towards others? Why am I talking about others? Why am I describing others? And how do I explain them? Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for such an excellent session. I hope all of you have enjoyed it. Uh, uh, without further ado, uh, there's a nice refreshing cup of tea for you outside. Uh, we have another terrific session. Uh, so shall we sort of reconvene in 15 minutes? Uh, you know, and uh, uh, Sukhar, thank you so much again for this excellent uh, a special talk by uh, one of the uh, best known experts in this area. Uh, uh, Dr. Somumrata Chaudhary, uh, Associate Professor School of Arts and Aesthetics in JNU, is going to uh, deliver the talk today. Uh, uh, the title is uh, very much there on your uh, program sheet. Uh, <coughs> uh, Dr. Chaudhary has, uh, Somo for us, has been uh, one of the, as far as I know, uh, one of the earliest persons who has been speaking about this uh, uh, thing called social theory. Uh, and we have known him since the 1980s to speak at that time uh, sort of uh, somebody like Foucault was just entering into the uh, portals of Indian academy uh, and uh, uh, already by that time uh, uh, Soma was uh, speaking uh, quite a bit about the nuances, the different aspects, the necessity of it and uh, uh, the best part was that he has got a very uh, deep uh, learning and background of the classics especially, uh, you know, Greek thinking, and he has worked a lot on Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and all of them. Uh, he has also been, he's also a very versatile personality in the sense that he's a playwright, he's a, a playwright, uh, he's acted, 
and uh, his uh, shows, theatre shows, have been very popular in Delhi and elsewhere. And uh, right since his college days, he has been a very vibrant person. So performative, uh, performativity, uh, theatre, uh, you know, theorizing. Uh, and social transformation are the interfaces within which uh, he basically works. Uh, he has spent uh, uh, a very nice time at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study at Shimla, from where he has uh, published his very famous book on theatre and performance. Uh, uh, he is going to speak uh, on uh, a certain aspect of social theory, a very specific focused aspect of social theory, and one of the most contemporary areas. Uh, which has got uh, uh, tremendous significance for what we are doing in the field of social transformation. Uh, uh, we'll uh, listen to what he has to say. Uh, uh, so, uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Somogratha Chaudhary to take the dice. <coughs> Please give me a big hand. <laughs> uh, this, uh, uh, the session will be chaired by uh, uh, Professor Ramesh Kamale. Uh, Ramesh is, uh, the, you know, the Fude Ambedkar Chair in the University of Bombay. Uh, 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 essentially a sociologist for persuasion, but uh, uh, very uh, deeply uh, involved in uh, Dalit politics all over Maharashtra. Uh, he has been uh, a person who has been, for me, uh, one of the uh, main inspirations in Bombay uh, regarding doing social theory, and especially its interface with uh, Dalit politics. And he has written quite a bit, but more than his writing, he has been through his interactions with colleagues, with students, uh, with activists, has been a, a tremendous inspiration. And uh, I really uh, uh, consider it a privilege and a pleasure to have him with us to chair this session. Uh, uh, Professor Kamle has also been uh, uh, the uh, main initiator of a very exciting MPhil program, which is starting very soon in the University of Bombay, hopefully by next year. Uh, uh, known as uh, MPhil in uh, Critical Cultural Studies. So we just had a brainstorming session and it's going through the normal you know, process of academic council and all that. So once we have that, I think uh, Bombay will become a very vibrant place and throw a challenge to Delhi as such. You know, we can include Calcutta into it if you want to. Uh, uh, but may I now request uh, Professor Kamle to take the chair. Uh, I now uh, hand over the session proceedings to Professor Kamlesh. Alright, we have had a very long day and I know and uh, I don't want to detain you any further and request I mean, Dr. Sombrata Chaudhary to stay go ahead with his talk and then uh, maybe after he finishes I might speak for 5 to 10 minutes and then we conclude the session with discussion. So, Okay, so uh, thank, thank you so much, Pansa, uh, for, for this uh, lovely honor. I don't know whether I deserve it, I seriously <coughs> doubt it, but I'll try my best to justify it. And uh, thank you for chairing the session. So, uh, what I do is uh, there's a text for this lecture. Uh, which I'll try and read for the most part. Uh, but before that, uh, let me just quickly summarize the three sections of this talk. It's called as is, uh, I'll, I'll go a bit slow because I don't see very well and the text, but it's not a long text, don't worry. Uh, the, te the, the lecture is called Society is Not a Substance, Contemporary Social Theory and Logics of the Hills. So this is three sections. Uh, the first section uh, refers straight away to uh, the contemporary political situation in India, uh, which means uh, that in the present, uh, among the people who occupy the government today, uh, the ruling classes, if you want to call it that, they're not strictly ruling classes. What I mean is the uh, the present ruling government and the party uh, which, which, which rules there. Uh, we notice in the present there is a certain sort of uh, increasing uh, unhappiness among one section of that 
of the people who follow or support this, this ruling dispensation against another section which equally supports this dispensation or forms even a part of the dispensation, which we all know. Uh, which is, of course, the, the part which is deeply unhappy, or at least says it's deeply unhappy, with the uh, increasing high-strung right-wing uh, <coughs> positions and declarations against uh, anybody and everybody who they think is anti-Hindu Indian society. Uh, and, and in the, that, uh, several campaigns are initiated with uh, greater and greater intensity and a kind of stubbornness, for instance, the conversion, karwapsi, and all that, uh, the love jihad. And the other party, which is also apparently supporting the same government, says that this is not what we supported this government for, this party for. And it says that we supported it for an agenda which is development. So we know this. So I'm going to, in the first section, refer to this phenomenon, this situation, and uh, contend that behind or un underlying this sort of a clash between two opposite sections of the same dispensation, there is actually a consistency, a complicity. And I'm going to say, uh, try to show a bit, that this complicity is based on a shared nihilism. So, the logic which cuts through this apparent clash of two views on how society uh, should be governed and what society is, there is a shared nihilism. That's the first section. So it refers to the current Indian situation. The second section is going to be a more general philosophical examination of the idea of nihilism in which I'm going to suggest that apart from these two views that I mentioned in the, that I'm going to talk about in the first section which exemplify something like limited nihilism or even negative nihilism. There is another sort of philosophical thinking about society which is founded on an ontological nihilism or an affirmative nihilism which asserts that society is originally founded on a nothing. It is not founded on any kind of positive attribute like community or identity or nationality or ethnicity or language. It is indeed founded on something which is fundamental to the human being or the being of the human being, which is a kind of originally nothingness. That I'm going to call an affirmative nihilism. And I'm going to talk about that as a philosophy of society or as the ground for another sort of social theory. In which I'm going to discuss an Italian thinker uh, called Roberto Esposito, a certain essay of his called Community and Nihilism. And the third section, which is not really a section but a kind of last part, uh, are going to be citations from two thinkers that I work with and on these days more and more, which is which will be examples of two thinkers who can help us break out of this sort of a deadlock between two sorts of nihilism uh, and make us look towards another kind of thinking about society, which is not about any kind of ontology of society or politics of society, but society is something which is to be created. Society as something which is a an event or a creation rather than something which exists whether ontologically or politically. Something which becomes as if society for the first time, as if there was no society till this moment when a new society is created. Obviously what I refer to society from the perspective of social revolution. In this I have two thinkers in mind which are who I'm going to cite very briefly. One is a contemporary European thinker, Ale Badiou, and the other is the great Indian thinker, Bihar Uh So this is the plan for the lecture. So I'm going to go to the text now. I hope to take not more than 45 to 50 minutes. <clears throat> Among the present dispensation, the rules us in India, it seems there exist two social ideologies, 
which express themselves in clashing voices. One declares in a somewhat milder Thatcherite manner, if there is such a thing as society, it is only the putative rationality that links various sites and instrumentalities so as to pass between them. Uh, Thatcherite manner because Margaret Thatcher was the one who made that notorious famous declaration that there is no such thing as society. Society is only a matter of intervention. The government creates society through policy. There is nothing as society. So I'm saying that there is a milder Thatcherite philosophy now in one side, on the one side, which says society is nothing but the rationality which controls and governs the different instrumental fields which actually produce certain results and sites which produce certain efficacy rather than society as a coherent total philosophy. The rationality doesn't proceed from any sort of social ratio or substantial reason or logos which underlies the several instrumental logics that surround us. Rather, it is a name on whose back rides the policymaker who both strategizes and commands the instrumental field. The policy maker, or should one say, the policy commander today, in light of the recent executive decisions and ordinances speaking in the name of a kind of rational exigency that rules us in India. So this exigency delegates a type of managerial or economic rationality as the representative of not society, but the name of society the name India as a society, which really hammers at us, you know, with increasing intensity and frequency. So this rationality in the name of society seizes, among others, particularly the techno-scientific field and wants to make it the locus of a kind of unanimous, enthusiastic, and yet murmurless, silent national social integration. Or rather, the ideological move is to secure and command such an immaculate integration. Now the apparently contrary ideological voice prescribes the following social philosophy. There is nothing else but society. Society is a continuous, homogeneous, and indivisible substance in whose consistency all heterogeneous instrumentalities, language games, identities, and historical institutions are absorbed. It is the superior consistency of all exigent inconsistencies, and herein lies its metaphysical nobility and sacred terror. So, um, the reference is obviously to the assertion which says that everything that has happened in history in terms of new historical developments, changes, whether that be in the field of social history, technical, technological history, scientific history, or any other kind of political history, all are only inconsistencies which are exigencies. They do not affect the superior consistency of society, which in a sense absorb all this. So hence, uh, you can very, very justifiably say, given this sort of a metaphysic or metaphysical nobility, you can produce a sacred terror that you cannot say in India something which, for instance, in the area of science, that something in the, in the name of scientific achievement or technological development did not take place in India in the first place. Hence the, I don't know what went wrong. Uh, hence, hence the assertion that all technical innovation that have taken place, yeah, all technical, te technological and scientific innovation that have taken place in the in the period of history or in history are already contained in some sort of an immemorial past. So there is no ontological exit from social being and belonging in such a philosophy, since such belonging is tied to the very depth of all being. So in all the flurry of individual and collective action, action in the extended sense of historical and existential invention, reform, even revolution, there is no real conversion, and I use the word consciously, there is no real conversion from the immemorial social substance. In other words, society is not merely forms of social being, it is the ground of all social philosophy, whether past, present, and future. Strictly speaking, then, there is no philosophy of society, because the latter is not an object that corresponds to the actual experience of any particular society or social group. <coughs> 
And in every empirical exigency of an inconsistency between the absolute speculative measure of society as such and forms of relative historical social existence, especially when such inconsistency threatens to translate into a rupture of the very idea of the continuum of society, that is, threatens the possibility of a social revolution, either the exigencies must be commanded out of existence or they must be reabsorbed in the immemorial consistency which always will have contained all the movement, all the historicity of change, disorientation and reorientation. So while there is a wealth of development in terms of instrumental, technological and other sorts of programs of society which in turn impinge on actual forms of life which are changing, society itself cannot and must not develop. For that would be to admit that society was not immemorially present in all its immaculate, vibrant, developed and consistent sense in the very first place. Now it is my contention that despite the apparent contrariety and even violent clashing nature between the two above views of the meaning and value of society, a clash that expresses itself with flagrant disregard for the outrage of the present-day Indian modern, the rationalist, even the liberal, who probably in vast numbers has voted for the present government. There is a structural and political complicity, even consistency between the two views. They are complicit and consistent with each other because the two views are both nihilist logics, which determine differentiated social philosophies, but with a shared economic and political stakes. But I also think that this is a limited diagnosis. The two ideologies, one relativist with a pragmatic orientation, the other absolutist with a metaphysical axiom, that axiom of society will not and must not develop, equally prescribe the limits beyond which any thought of social constitution must not go. And in case of any interruptive historical actuality that threatens to either force a new social philosophy, so anything new in the radical sense, something unforeseen by hitherto existing social theory, or something which hollows out the substantial and immemorial substance of the metaphysics of society, if such a thing happens, such a historical actuality must itself be forced or commanded out of existence. Hence, Two apparently clashing sets of propositions are united in their overall functioning as what could be called negative nihilisms with a shared favor for decisionist politics. So that is the logic behind ordinances, executive decrees, which I, which I, I don't think are contingent merely in the, in the current uh, you know, uh, story of the legislation that's going on, or the attempt to legislate on the uh, land, land ordinance bill and all that. The decisionism of, 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 of making such a, dis, a, a policy come into the body of society is something which both the apparently clashing sides of social philosophy share. And that is essential to the nature of their shared nihilism because they will not accept anything new which produces another thought of society beyond the axiom that either society is only a field of instrumental policy or society is an absolute existence without any history. So in this light, the decision of politics, the decision of economics, the decision of the techniques of life are inseparable from the exercise of power at every stage and threshold of these very sites. In light of the above, the question then arises whether it is possible to unfold a thought of, the, of a certain kind of positive nihilism that would be indispensable for grasping the constitution and emergence of society, both as historical actuality and philosophical theory. And what would be the affirmative contribution of the nihil, the nothing, in Latin the nihil is nothing, the nothing, in forming society as an event of history and of thought. So nothing now brought to history, rather than nothing being an axiom beyond history or outside history. Further, coeval with the challenge of articulating a sort of social consistency which comprises institutions, instrumentalities, techniques, and forms of life, 
with the fundamental ontological inconsistency of a thought of the something like a void point of all society, that all society is made from something which does not contain a substance, arises the difficulty of thinking of what would be a commensurate politics of society which is based on a society which is to be transformed, a politics of social transformation, which does not have at its core a certain substance of society. Which of course means the question of uh, eventually the ontology of identity, social identity, I'll come to that. So in what is to follow, I'll indicate some lines along which the negative, the positive and the equivocal logics of nihilism which determine and affect certain key trends of contemporary social and political theory can be disentangled. So the second section now, which moves the terrain from the Indian immediate Indian historical context to something which is in the domain of uh, philosophy and the relationship of philosophy to social theory. <clears throat> in a short text published as part of the book, his book, Introduction to Metaphysics, Martin Heidegger refers to the second passage or the second stasimum of the chorus in the ancient Greek play Antigone by Sophocles. Uh, this is after, and uh, you know, in the play Antigone, the crisis of the play arises because uh, the king had given an order that one of the brothers of this character called Antigone, who is actually the, the, uh, she, she's, she's a princess, she's part of the royal household. One of the brothers who was a traitor, apparently a traitor, uh, in his death must not be buried. He must be left in the open ground to, uh, to, 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 to be left without ritual burial, to, be, uh, to his body to be, to, be, to be eaten up by vultures and dogs. And this was the, this was the lesson that the city, any, any further traitors would learn uh, by depriving the body of ritual social uh, honors. So Antigone tries to bury the brother in secret. And the first time it, it is known that someone has tried to bury the brother, the chorus, which means the, the, the citizens of the, of the city, they get extremely, they get uh, extremely disturbed by what has happened because they cannot understand that how any individual can violate the order of the sovereign, the king. And then the chorus speaks a particular, a, a long poetic passage called the Stasimum. <clears throat> In the speech, sometimes called Ode to Man, the chorus praises the great genius of man to have found the way in Greek, the word way is poros, from where we get the word poros, something through which you can pass. So the way poros, through the most intractable impasses, which is a poros, where you can't pass in the world, which includes in this passage, Pantos poros, say the chorus says man has been able to move through the ocean. It has been able to invent language. It has been able to make institutions. It has been able to move through all the intractable impasses which apparently could not be overcome and man has been able to do that. So man is in that sense a great inventor of ways. And yet, after all that, man has to encounter the greatest impasse of all, which is his own self. Here the Greek text uses the word dynon, which in English is usually translated as strange. Man is a stranger to himself. Heidegger, in his interpretation, employs the German word unhandlike or uncanny. Freud also uses it in another context. For man's fundamental anxiety when confronted with the question of constituting the self-relation of his being with the very nature of the being of his being. Here in man is anxious and trembles at the threshold of a foundational abyss or nothingness instead of any firm ground where he can place his being on. In a sense, in the play Antigone and in Heidegger's interpretation, this is a threshold of crisis of man's pre-constituted relations with himself and with other men and the combined efficacy that carries the presumption of the name society. So society is nothing here but the understanding that all the activities of society must carry on uninterrupted efficaciously. Once that efficacy is threatened, then man in his crisis, no collapse of efficacy, becomes as if nothing, insofar as he is thrown back upon his originary nothingness, which is as much a kind of strangeness 
So the word strangeness sometimes is interpreted as nothingness, though we understand that the word strangeness is a, an adjective, but nothingness is a state. But often in the translation of the Greek word dynom, strangeness and nothingness are interchanged, and Heidegger in particular emphasizes this proximity between strangeness and nothingness, the adjective and the, and the, and the substantive ontological idea of nothingness. So for the world of Greek tragedy, there are two options. Either violently exclude the nothingness to attempt to perpetuate the regime of historical society, which the king wants to do, or encounter the violence of the nothing to never cease attempting, attending to this event in the historical journeys of all socialization. So the chorus represents the encounter of the violence that such a thing is possible. However much the, the, the politics of, of the king might prevent uh, such a thing from happening with the threat of death, still such a thing actually happens, such an event actually happens. So how to confront the violence of this, of this fundamental strange thing that people disobey? This is the point of Antigone. The chorus doesn't understand disobedience, and yet it has to confront disobedience. Now modern philosophy of existence cannot afford the Greek choice of something where it the, 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 the order can be carried on by the sovereign or something like an incomprehensible rebellion takes place on behalf of someone who is as if a social insolvent, a social, uh, someone who is uh, socially unacceptable because after all Antigone is a woman and she comes into the public space where a woman should not be. So she belongs to the oikos, the household, and she comes into the police where she commits this, this transgression, and to that extent she is unacceptable there. That is the Greek choice, but in the modern choice, in the modern philosophy of existence, we cannot afford the choice of the Greeks. And we must assume the only way forward, which is the way of a kind of inward or reflective consciousness that is anguished and alien for the very self who bears it, who has to confront the fact that not Antigone as someone who is outside yourself, but all of us are responsible for our own actions. And to that extent, we have a responsibility to disobey. This is the modern social choice. While for, for, for the chorus in the ancient Greek choice, Antigone was always other. Now, in an important essay called Community and Nihilism, the contemporary Italian thinker Roberto Esposito extends the Heideggerian investigation from its modern existential hollow of all social consistency to the general ontological status of community. So Esposito refers to another Heidegger's essay called The Thing to bring up the double nihilism contained both in the idea of the thing as something like pure substantive objectivity and in that of community as the fullness of some sort of an organic identitarian participation. In both cases, we need an archaeology of nihilism. And this archaeology consists of uncovering the fundamental void underlying the so-called essence, the thingness of the thing, or the being communitarian or communal, not in the sense that we use it in India, but in the, in the generic sense, the being communal of community. As Esposito writes, and I quote, the essence of the thing is therefore it's nothing, to the extent that outside of this perspective that this opens, the thing loses its most intimate nature to the point of disappearing, or as Heidegger has it, to the point of being annihilated. So there are two nihilisms here. The nihilism which constitutes the thing, and the nihilism which annihilates that very constitution. So if you neglect the nihilism, then you annihilate the nihilism. So the double nihilism. This brings up the second articulation of nihilism insofar as the neglect of the essential nothingness of the thing, which is the same thing as community, annihilates the very being of that thing, which is the community. In this essay, Community and Nihilism, as well as his book Communitas, Esposito's thesis begins from the proposition that the, you know, the well-known uh, structural distinction between Jesselshaft and Gemenshaft, the Dionysian distinction between community and society, organic against individualized solidarity and so on, which culminates in the historical rupture of modernity, Esposito's thesis suggests that we complicate and put into question this distinction. In Esposito's hypothesis, hypothesis which uh, and the demonstration launches very interestingly from an etymological examination of the Latin word munus, 
contained in communitas. So you have the word community or communitas in which the, the central uh, Latin uh, component is munus. Now munus actually means from which the word munificent comes in English, uh, which means you know generous. So it actually means gift, uh, uh, to give. But interestingly, munus in Latin does not mean the receiving of the gift. It means the giving of the gift. So anthropologically what it means is, in the cycle of the gift, the gift is given, but we don't know if it is ever or where it is received. So it is like a gift which is always given but never received, which produces in the circuit a lack or a nothingness or a void, because once you give something, there is that place is not occupied by anything got back. So there is a void. And that void has to circulate. Because at every point, it is the gift which is only given and it's not received. So the economy is never, the, 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 the circuit is never completed. And in that sense, community is the continuous traveling of the gift which is never received. And hence, the lack of the void, what he calls the nihil. So community is constituted by the nihil. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, Esposito's, Esposito's uh, uh, method of showing in his book as well as the essay, the originary being of a community has woven from a constitutive void or lack that is always material of all primordial social identity. Even before the distinction between communitarian ideology and modern alienated society becomes operational, community is already an expropriated relational nexus at its very founding in the void, just as the ontology of the thing is for Heidegger. However, it seems to me that there exists a significant equivocation of, not confusion, but oscillation in Esposito's thesis. It is this, that we are not certain whether the constitutive lack or nothingness which structures and circulates in the communitarian relation is ontologically founded. That is, if, like in Heidegger, that human being, the being of the human being is founded in a lack, is it that? Or is it something which has an anthropological basis? The human society is based on something which is in the nature of an economy, which always is the gifting of someone with something, but for which the economy is never closed. In that sense, a community is always an open economy. Is it an anthropological idea, or is it an ontological idea? About this, we are not sure. And Esposito's thesis then seems either there is a primordial ontological thesis, philosophy of society, which is always a communitarian openness with this lack circulating forever, or it is actually a diagnosis of modern alienated society, which we know is constituted by a certain kind of alienness, anguish, which Marx was the great thinker of to begin with. And what Esposito is doing is actually producing an image of community through the image of the alienated modern society, which is a historical society. So it's a confusion that we have, that is this a thesis on community retrospectively through the image of alienated modern society, or is this an original thesis, which is a philosophical thesis, that community is based on ontology of nothingness, which would be strictly Heideggerian. About this, I'm not sure. Nevertheless, the, even despite this equivocation, uh, it does not detract from the great value of understanding community not as a property to be communally possessed or collectively partitioned and participated in, but as a form of negativity or nothingness that still is not weightless and ephemeral, but is a kind of force of common or shared alienness. So the, one of the very powerful conclusions of this thesis is, whether ontological or anthropological is, what is common to all of us is that we all share the alien possibility that we have to transact with others. So the, he says that it's not a question of relationships between men. It is a question that men are recognizable as social only through relationships. And relationships essentially are an ontology of otherness. So otherness is constitutive of ourselves rather than otherness being something like an externalization of self in relations. So in that sense, what we have is a shared commonness, which is the commonness of being alien, of being non-common, of being some, some, some sort of a subject who does not recognize herself in every time she has to relate to others, and to that extent become other. Now, this entire thesis can be pictured 
as a philosophical politics of a new idea of being in common, inherited from the axiomatic which, which, uh, which, which cuts through or intervenes in the separation of pre-modern and modern society. So, you know, we think of pre-modern society as a society of one sort of solidarity, which is organic, and modern society as individualistic. So this cuts through that separation. A new being in common that draws out then political potentialities which also cut beyond the separative options of secular and religious identity, citizenship and pre-citizenship, subjecthood, which is archaic subjecthood, organic and mechanical solidarity, and so on. One might think of, in this light also, well, the influential Italian, other Italian thinker, more well known in India, Giorgio Agamben's work, as also a consolidation of this sort of a kind of potential politics, in which, on the one hand, Agamben conducts genealogical analyses in the style of Foucault, of social forms with governmentality, or I suppose it has a very interesting word, it's an immunization. So, government and he takes Thomas Hobbes as the first uh, political theorist who produces a theory of state as immunization, like we speak of immune, we, we conduct for children or for populations immunization against something like endemic diseases that might strike the body of society. Hence, we need an immunization against the very idea of communitas, because communitas is built on idea of lack. So we must need to immunize ourselves against this dangerous lack. So state in that sense through Hobbes can be seen as an immunizing agency. Government is like day-to-day -day immunization and state power can also be seen in those immunizations which are more strictly or directly invasive, but still immunization. So government and immunization can be used uh, in, a, in a similar way. So this would be the politics. The politics which would go beyond the idea of sovereignty and immunization and in that sense would be a politics which is a coming politics, as uh, Agamben calls it. But I also think, and this is a bit of my own work that I'd like to very modestly put for you, uh, before you, that it is also possible to translate the thesis on community and heroism into somewhat more concrete historical terms with philosophical and political implications. It is possible to diagnose a kind of nihilism which is masked of certain societies, which include Western society, but also Brahmanical society in India, which I'll explain in a moment, which in the long run is constituted as societies of debt, which are constituted by a logic of debt. It is possible to show that societies to begin with start on a limited scale of debt and induction of subjective obligation to pay that debt, which is a kind of debt that subjects do not merely pay to other subjects in the sense of money debt which I borrow from someone else and I pay back or not pay back and which have very grave consequences we know in India in particular with all the devastation that is caused by debt. But here is a debt which is a debt to society itself. Community is only an identitarian mask for subjects avowing this essentially unpayable debt to society which is totalizable only as the other. So all society is always other. There is nothing like my society. Insofar as there is society, it is always other to which I owe a debt. To that extent, the history of society is nothing but the simultaneous globalization of the scale of debt and the minoritization of the magnitude of debt to this other. A process which again bypasses the dominant periodization of pre-modern and modern society, provincial and global society. So this is my criticism of uh, this whole post-colonial framework of provincial and global. So let me explain this because this is only an abstract assertion very quickly. Now, uh, the material here is this. There is a sort of debt in Western society which starts from the Greeks, which is a very peculiar kind of debt, which starts from a form of in ancient Greek society, during the democratic period, what the government used to do was to institute a kind of funding which they called theorik. So theory is contained in that word, Greek word, theorik, which was very peculiar because what they did was they gave a kind of dole, a small amount of money to the citizens, and they asked the citizens, it's like cash transfer in our times, you give a dole and you ask the citizens to use that dole to now undertake certain activities. So, you would come to the theatre to watch theatre by paying that dole as a fee on the gate. 
The same money that the state is giving you, you have to now pay back at the gate of the theatre. The grain that you buy, the citizens that buy the grain, procure the grain from this fund. So you get a donor from the state which you then pay back as uh, to get grain. The jury service, investment society jury service is a major thing up, even now in America. So public plays a part in litigation. Now the jury is paid out of this donor. The citizens pay all the jury from here. Now this is a peculiar kind of funding which you, you know, immediately wonder why aren't they let, uh, they're just given free entrance? Why aren't you let free into the theater? Why aren't you simply given free grain? But it is the same logic that is part of our debate in our times. It is this, that we must make the citizen, irrespective of rich or poor, mark his participation in society. So including eating, the citizens eating is not the same thing as the slaves eating. So peculiarly slaves might just give, get free grain if the master chooses to give free grain. But the citizens must pay, but there could be a poor citizen. So Pericles says that whether poor or rich, no one must be, no one must be pretended, uh, sorry, prevented from entering the theatre. Which means that even the poor must be given that dole. But he must be given that dole because participating in the theatre or in culture is a debt you owe to society. You do not simply like an like a, like a, like a, like an animal enjoy the theatre. Like a human being, you participate in the theatre. So peculiarly, debt becomes a mark of obligation and power in this framework. Now, if you look at the uh, the the, Bra the text Brahmana, Charles Malabud has done excellent work on this on the, on the Brahmana's text uh, among the Upanishads. He shows us that the ontological debt that the Brahmana has to the Guru and the, the, the Pitri and so on are debts which are unpayable. And they are what he calls ontological debt. You're born into that debt. You don't borrow, you're already in debt when you are brown a Brahman. And it marks the Brahman's power and higher obligation. So when Ashwatthama comes in as a great challenger, then Ashwatthama through Dronacharya's terrible trick that he plays is made to give the Dakshina without being the, the student. The real student. But when he actually substitutes the idol of Dronacharya as his uh, teacher, then Dronacharya extracts the thumb as a kind of drakshana, the, the, the payment of the debt. Because the power of the debt is a power which only the Brahmins or the Kshatriyas or, or, or the high caste can enjoy. It's an enjoying of the debt as obligation. And obligation, enjoyment to be an obligation. So this peculiar logic. So in that sense, debt is a mode of social transaction which is a negativity which is productively or positively deployed in society. So this is a very, very uh, you know, uh, condensed summary. But what is happening, it seems to me, between the ancient times carrying on historically is that this debt is globally extended and in terms of magnitude, it is made more and more minor. Which means this, in Christianity what happens is that from the 12th century or 13th century or so, you don't even have to be part of the church to be a Christian. All you have to do is to give a certain tax, which is called a tithe. So you can sit at home and give that tithe. So up to the modern economists like uh, David Ricardo and Adam Smith, you have mentioned of the 10% land produced to be given to the church, which they think, Adam Smith thinks, is a waste of money. Why do you give that money to you know, the church? It should be used for actual productive use. <laughs> Nevertheless, just by giving that particular amount, whether 10% or even less, you become a part of the congregation of the church, which means you're paying your debt to the church without being present in the church. So money again becomes, at a very minor level, becomes both a way of being part of a community where the community is not anymore territorially delimited. So this tithe can be paid by a Spanish Christian, by an Indian Christian, or by a European Christian. Of course, there are always exceptions to this that we can go into, but overall the logic is global and minoritarian. So the more it becomes global, the logic of debt, more the, the debt appears as if it is not there. So I can, I can give just two rupees and I won't even think about it, but I am paying a debt. To that extent, we move from organic collective societies to more and more individualist societies and yet the technology of death as an induction of subjective obligation remains. That is my thesis. And I 
in the last part show how this is connected to cost. To the excruciatingly small and shattering difference between the radicality which is ontological of the nothing and the historical rationality of making the almost nothing debt corresponding to a political rationality of making people subject to forms of power as different from refusing that very notion of debt which could be called defaulting. So what we do not have in Esposito, Agamben and this sort of politics which is both genealogical and, and, a, kind of, and a kind of strategic politics against government is the idea that an event of defaulting is possible. So in the French Revolution, you know, the first slogan that was given, which uh, the historian Michelet writes about, is very interesting. It says that the people of France joyfully defaulted on their own inheritance of the church by refusing to pay the tithes. So you default on the inheritance. So they are members of the church. And so far as they're members of the church, they're members of a history of power. But you default on power. So when you default on power joyfully, willingly, then you default on the credit, not on the debit, on the debt merely. That is the crucial revolutionary notion of defaulting on the credit. So the value of the credit doesn't exist insofar as the people of France at that moment refused to be Christian. So these are events of defaulting that take place historically on the debt of society both in substantiality and in its otherness. Such defaulting is not at all the failure in, or incapacity to pay the debt, which failure, of course, describes the condition of oppression and victimage, which in, 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 in this part of Western India we, we have the most terrible examples of. But in this case, it is the refusal of the very ontological enforcement of the debt. Now the conjunction of such defaulting can very well be occasion of, of course, reinstituting the debt. So, for instance, French Revolution reinstitutes the debt in terms of the individual labor. So labor becomes a new kind of debt you pay to society. Everyone must participate in labor to contribute to production. So the French Revolution distinguishes between active citizens who produce and passive citizens who don't produce. Which is a sentiment of you know, our times also. So in Rajasthan, you have an ordinance, again, which says that people who don't have education can't be part of the the, the ground which